Hey guys, Sarah here from My Life Out of a Lab Coat, and it's time for a weekend project. This weekend, my project is making some couch cushions for Kevin's new apartment. So, in order to do that, I headed down to Ikea to pick up some of the white cushions that they have to fill their cushion covers. And they usually have those square white cushions, the regular price I believe is $5 Canadian, and that's what I would have bought, but they had these green ones, and these are not necessarily meant to go inside a cushion, uh, but they were on clearance for $4, so I picked up these two green ones instead. They're the same size as the white uh, cushion fillers. And while I was there, um, I don't know if you guys know, but Ikea does in fact sell some fabric. And not only do they sell fabric by the yard, but you can usually find bundles of fabric swatches for $5. So for $5, they had this bundle of swatches. And in the swatch bundles, you get 10 swatches of each of the fabrics. And you can usually sort of see what fabrics you're getting. Uh, the bundles come rolled up like so, and you can kind of flick through them to see which fabric swatches you're getting and then you can refer to the hanging full-size fabric pieces to sort of pick which bundle you're getting. So in my $5 bundle I got 10 swatches of this black and white um, print which I really like. Um, 10 swatches of this geometric um, reds, greens, and oranges sort of swatch. Not too much of a fan of that one. Ten swatches of this really lovely, um, it's like a tan with brights uh, geometric swatch. And this is actually the swatch that drove me to pick this particular bundle. So I'm excited to use those later. And ten of this sort of orange. Uh, lemon sort of swatches, so they're kind of these shapes. Some of them have more of the black and white stems, so I'm not sure where I'm going to put those use, what use I'm going to put those to yet. But the ones that I'm going to go ahead and use right now are the 10 swatches of the cross section pieces of wooden logs. Since these are going to be cushions for Kevin's couch, um, I thought this was sort of masculine enough to go in a guy's apartment. So, I'm going to show you how I picked out uh, of these 10 swatches. I'm going to work with 9 of them since one of them was sort of a, um, probably at the end of the roll and it's a bit of a printing issue where it looks like, you know, this bit here got some extra blue dye. So that one is a toss away. But I'm going to use the rest of these 9 in a geometric grid pattern for the front of the cushion. For the back of the cushion, I'm going to use a bit of this fabric. Um, I thought this would be a good one because it's nice and soft, it's still fairly masculine in colour. Um, it'll go, I think, alright with the uh, wood um, bits. And the pattern on here, these little medallions almost look like cross section through a tree stem, so I think it'll be good for the back of the cushion. This fabric here is from Fabricland, and I don't know if you're aware, but Fabricland sells the ends of the bolts of fabric for super cheap. So it's, you know, the full uh, meter and a half width that their fabric usually is. It's only, you know, just wide enough to be good for a cushion cover, but I only paid a dollar and 15 cents for this. So I highly recommend if you are looking for an inexpensive way to um, build your fabric stash. If you go into Fabricland, you don't have to have the membership to get the deal on these. They usually have baskets of them near the cutting tables and it's just the ends. Um, every time you go in, they're gonna have different stuff there and you'll find fabrics that would normally be something like $7 to $30 for a yard and you might be able to pick them up for a dollar. Um, so that's an awesome way to build your fabric stashes. Uh, I personally, every time I'm near my local fabric land, I pop in and just root through the bins. If I don't find anything, whatever. But if I do find stuff, you can get some really great deals on small pieces, shortcuts of fabric, which are great for sort of weekend craft projects. 
So I'm going to change the camera angle and show you my sewing table and how I patterned out the squares for the front and then we'll get some video of me sewing them together. So what I did was I just laid out my squares um, in a grid pattern, a 3x3 three three grid that alternated between sort of two recurring motifs in them. So I'm alternating between large uh, cross-sectional pieces and the small circular cross-sectional pieces so that you don't get, um, you know, you don't want to have your overall final fabric to be heavy in the large pieces of one area and heavy in the small pieces in another area. The other thing that I watched out for is I wouldn't want to place anything like this because when you sew it together it's going to look like a mismatch in the fabric. So instead what I did was I sort of intentionally made sure that the edges are quite buried so that instead of getting something that looks like an error you get an intentional um, edge between this square and the square. Now once I have these pieced out I know that they're going to be big enough and then some to cover my cushion with some space allowed for seam allowances. So based on the size of the cushion relative to this, when I sew these together, I'm gonna probably leave a half inch seam allowance uh, as I sew down the edges, which will shorten in my finished square by an inch in each direction. So these will come in an inch and this will come in an inch. And then when I sew back to front together, um, I'll probably leave maybe even a full inch seam allowance uh, back to front to tighten in my square to fit my cushion even better. So I'm just going to go ahead and begin sewing. So if you've never done any sewing before, this is a great beginner project because you didn't have to cut anything, at least for this stage. These are already true squares, they're already um, exactly the same size. And when you're sewing, you just want to always lay uh, good side to good side and then we're going to sew a, like I said, um, probably like a half inch uh, seam allowance just using my sewing machine. So this sewing machine certainly isn't anything fancy. This is the Singer Prelude. Um, it's the one that you can find for about $100 at Walmart and I've had this sewing machine for like five years now I think. Uh, I highly recommend every household, especially if you're into any sort of DIY, um, if you can budget for it, pick up a sewing machine. Um, you know, $100 might seem like you're on the cheap end, but because it is a Singer and that is sort of a reputable brand as far as sewing goes, I haven't had anything, any issues with this one. It's over five years old and anytime that you have a small issue, so if you need to replace needles, if you, um, you know, break apart, you can find Singer replacement parts much easier. Um, if you're in Ikea in the sewing section, they do sell a small Ikea sewing machine for about $80. Uh, the problem I think going with the Ikea one is that if you do break apart or lose a part, Ikea is not a company that's going to have support for their sewing machines. But Singer will definitely support you in you know, repairs on your machine, replacement parts on your machine, even if you only paid $100 for their cheapest model. So. All I have here is my regular walking foot, just the regular sewing needle that came with the sewing machine, and I'm going to sew a straight seam. So I've turned this knob um, to do a straight seam with the stitch going through the middle, and I'm going to go ahead and sew my first edge. So if you can see, um, you might not be able to see too well, but sewing machines usually have a gauge guide uh, on the platform next to where your needle action is happening, and they're in sort of, you know, eighth of an inch. I'm not good at, met or at Imperial, but they're in increments, so you have a quarter inch, you have a half inch. Yes, they're in eighth of an inch increments. So if you want to sew a half inch seam from your sewing needle, to the first one, you're already at a quarter of an inch. So if you just move the edge of your fabric to the next quarter of an inch markation out from the needle, then you're ready to sew a half inch seam allowance. And you just use this as a guide as you're running your fabric along to make sure that your seam allowance is staying constant. So I can lower the foot down and 
so forward a bit. Now you always want to reverse at the very beginning of sewing and reverse back over those stitches and sew back over them another time. So by doing that little reverse and come forward, you're locking in the stitches so that that bit of fabric is not going to pull apart as easily. Um, if you had just started sewing and not done that, then it's very easy to pull that seam apart. So always when you finish and when you end, do a little reverse back and forth over your stitches. Now I'm just going to sew uh, using my guide for my seam allowance, I'm just going to sew straight down the edge of this square. And when I get to the end, I'm going to reverse again and then come forward again. Before I lift my foot, I always move my needle to make sure it's in the upright full center position. Uh, and you can manually adjust where your needle is on most sewing machines with a knob on the end. In fact, if you really wanted to sew slowly, you could just by cranking this knob and not using the foot pedal, really slowly sew your entire piece of fabric. So then you can snip your long ends. There's usually a thread cutter um, either on the side or in behind to snip your ends. And now you've got your first seam sewn and by having the good sides together, when you open it up, you've got a nice straight seam. So you can go ahead and repeat that again to put in the next stitch in, or the next square in your pattern. So this was my middle square. So all I'm gonna go ahead and do is put my middle square good side down and line up this end. And then go ahead and sew my next uh, seam. Alright, so now I have my bottom three sewn together. So I'm going to repeat that for the middle three, repeat that from the top three, and then I'll show you sewing the three strips together. This next step is one that I routinely get too impatient to deal with and skip, but I highly recommend it. And that is ironing out your seams before you go on to piecing in the opposite direction. So you can see on this piece, I haven't ironed the seams and the um, seam allowance pokes out like this. And in addition, on the front of the fabric, you kind of get a little bit of a curve like this. On this piece here, I've ironed those seam allowances, and you can see that the seam allowances want to lie flatter in one direction, and the front of the fabric as a result is smooth. So all you just need is your iron and, iron and your ironing board. Throw your fabric down and pick one direction. So I'm gonna iron all of my seam allowances so that they're folding this way, and iron them flat. And since this is a cotton fabric, it's a cotton upholstery fabric, you can turn your iron up uh, to a pretty hot temperature and you're not going to run into any issues. And I just go in this direction across that seam allowance and iron it flat. That might seem like it takes extra time and it definitely feels like you have to take a stop from sewing um, and spend extra time to iron your seam allowances flat, but little things like that are going to be what takes your finished product up from something that looks clearly handmade to something that looks well finished. So now that I have my three strips ready to go, I'm ready to sew the next seam. So I know this one here is the bottom. Uh, and I know that because I've marked all of my squares just with marker on the back, so I know where they go in the grid. And this one here is the middle. So again, I just take good sides facing up, and I know I want it to go like this. And then I just go ahead and fold it over, and I sew again good sides facing good sides. Now the next thing here is that you'll see the way that I have things right now. I have one seam allowance 
folding in this direction and one seam allowance folding in the opposite direction. And by doing it this way, you're ensuring that you don't have a bulky section and a thin section. So when I come across here, I don't have all the seam allowances on one side giving a bulky section. Um, and that's another thing that's going to help make the finished product look a little bit more professional. So I can just paint this over here um, under my sewing machine and sew down uh, the seam. And again, you want to back up over those starting stitches. And I'm gonna sew along until I begin to approach my, um, my seam here. When I get to the seam, it's important to slow down and make sure that you don't accidentally catch things up and have it flip backwards in the opposite direction of what you folded. So I'm going to go a little bit slower until I know that my folded seam is down underneath the feet of my, um, underneath the foot or the stitch guide. And then I can go ahead and sew across it. Um, this is cotton upholstery fabric and going through those seams is not too much for it to handle, but if you are working with something like denim, you're having a place here where you're sewing through three layers of fabric and you might, if you're using thicker fabrics, need to either use a needle that's indicated for thicker fabrics or a little trick that you can do is sew using the foot until you get to the seam and then hand crank. Um, the stitches as you go over the thicker area and that's just going to um, lower, minimize the risk of breaking a needle or something. And that's it for sewing that seam together. And by doing it this way, you can see that on the front of the fabric, you're getting nice alignment. Um, you know, you're getting all four seams coming together into a nice square point. I'm gonna go ahead and add on the next one now. And then I will show you what I'm gonna do to cut the size of the back. So I've got the full top piece of my cushion sewn together. And once again, I also ironed down the seam allowances flat in the back so that the front looks nice and smooth and you can see that I got great alignment of uh, three out of my four corners using this method. Uh, this one's just off by maybe like, you know, an eighth of an inch, but you might not notice that, hopefully you won't notice that in the final pillow. So now I'm ready to use my Fabricland uh, end of a bolt uh, cheap $1.15 piece of fabric to create the back of my cushion. So I've already double checked that the width of this fabric is the width that I'm gonna want on the back of my cushion. And yes, my front is wider than this, so if I lay it on like so, my front piece, which I knew going into it, was too big for my cushion, but that's okay. So what I'm gonna do to cut the back is I'm just laying it on my cushion front piece and I'm going to give myself a little bit of extra space um, past the end of my front piece and then cut as straight as I can with scissors across. So I'll just grab my scissors and I'm gonna give myself, you know, about this much. That's like, I don't know, maybe three inches of extra space. And I'm gonna cut as straight as I possibly can going across. When you have a printed fabric like this, it's kind of nice because you can use the print to kind of estimate that you're cutting things straight. So to make sure that I cut it straight, I just fold the fabric back on itself. And I know that the commercial end of the fabric here is straight, so I can just trim this little bit where I cut uh, crooked, like so. So now what I have is I have a square uh, front piece for my cushion and I have a rectangular back piece for my cushion. So you have options when you're making cushions. I could have cut this back piece square to the size that I want my cushion to be and then sewn everything around leaving a small opening to stuff the cushion form in and then hand sew that seam closed. 
What I'm gonna show you is like an overlapping back of the cushion that will make it easier to pull the cushion form out so that you can wash the uh, cushion cover. So the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm going to line up my mill end, so the, the straight end of my bottom with the bottom of my square. And then I'm going to shrug it up about this far because I know that I've got about an extra inch of length on my front piece based on the size of my green uh, cushion interior. Now I'm going to go ahead and just fold this to about the halfway point. Um, halfway on the cushion square and not halfway on the piece of fabric. Now I'm going to go ahead and cut all the way across right here using my scissors. And if I fold it and I folded it um, so that the vertical edges are lined up with each other, I should just be able to cut a nice straight line by cutting right in that fold. You could, of course, use um, a cutting mat and a rotary cutter to make sure that your edges are straight, but just in doing that, it looks like I've got a fairly straight edge. Uh, and trim that piece there. So now what I have is I have a shorter piece right here and a longer piece up here. That if I move them both in so that they're starting an inch from the edge of my front piece, then I know that I've got some great overlap here. And the key to that overlap is we're going to hem these edges with just a small uh, rolled hem. And then we're going to sew all the way around the outside to create the square edges of the cushion. And then we're going to just seam these guys together about to here, which will give us a pocket that you can get the green cushion fill uh, in and out so that you can wash the cushion cover. So I'm going to move back to the sewing machine and show you exactly how I'm going to roll this hem and sew this together and then I'll sew the whole thing together. So we're almost there. So I'm going to take the smaller piece here and in order to roll a hem um, you can do it the proper way <coughs> which would be to get the iron back out and fold it over uh, twice and then iron it flat and then sew it up but I'm gonna go ahead and do this the kind of lazy way, the rolled hem way. So all that you need to do is you need to, working with the back side of the fabric facing you, you need to roll it in a bit and then fold it over. And so I'm gonna start sewing and as I work my way across, I'm going to just keep rolling it and folding it so that the uh, bad end is tucked in and the folded over piece is consistent in size. And to make sure that it doesn't escape on me, when I do a rolled hem, um, I like to do it on a zigzag stitch. So I've just switched to a uh, zigzag stitch over here on my sewing machine. So I'm gonna just get it started by rolling and folding. And I've got maybe a quarter of an inch uh, sort of rolled hem there. And I'm going to move my sewing needle so that I'm zigzagging, zigzagging right over that rolled edge. And just like before, we want to back up over those first couple of stitches. And then you can start to roll and zigzag along. Um, I'm just using white thread because it's what I happen to have on my sewing machine at the time. And I was a little bit uh, lazy in the regards of looking for a thread the color that matched my fabric better. If you really want the back of your cushion to be free of a white zigzag along this rolled hem, then by all means pick a, um, a thread color that matches the fabric better. Or you could very carefully use a non-zigzagging stitch uh, in a matching thread color along the edge of this rolled hem and that would work just as well. So I'm just rolling and I'm keeping the roll and the fold uh, as consistent as I can in size. And sewing along. Alright, and 
there's a rolled hem that's not gonna go anywhere. And from the good side of the fabric, you can see the zigzag white stitch, but I don't mind it. So I'm gonna do that same process along the edge of the larger piece of fabric. Got the rolled hem on the second piece of fabric. So now I'm going to sew these guys together. So if you can kind of see over here, the situation that I want to have is I want to have a couple of inches of overlap um, between these guys. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to come along and sew along this zigzag up to about here and sew along this zigzag up to about here from this side and that's going to give me a opening through which I can wedge the pillow. Um, and just looking at that as a test, that might be a bit of pain. So I'm just going to come in uh, about three inches on each side to sew these guys together. And now I'm going to switch away from the zigzag and back to a straight stitch just so that um, I can preserve this zigzag, which looks kind of nice on this fabric, and I'm going to put a straight stitch underneath it. So that's just a purely, um, a purely aesthetic thing. The other thing that you might want to do is you may want to line up the pattern. Depending on what kind of fabric you're working with, you may want to line up the pattern on the two pieces. I'm just going to come out to the end of this whole piece here, and reverse, and then pull this out, and then I'm going to go ahead and repeat that on the other side, make sure that everything is staying nice and flat and straight to the best of your ability. I just came in three repeats of the pattern on this side. And the stitches. Alright, so now if you switch to the back, you can see you've got quite a bit of overlap there. So you're not going to see any of the inside of this cushion, but you do have an opening through which you can shove the cushion filler um, into the cushion. So now we're ready to sew the cushion back onto the cushion front. So again, as with everything else, you want good sides facing good sides. And all I'm gonna do is, I know this square is the size that I want to fit my cushion. And I know that because if I take my green cushion and I lay my square on it, it is the size that will cover it. So I know just looking at this, my piece of fabric completely covers the green cushion. So, since I know that, I can go ahead and just center my cushion back square on this larger piece of fabric, the cushion front, pin it into place, and then sew all the way around. And these are the seams that are gonna seem the most action. So what I'm gonna do, and this is a personal preference thing, um, to reinforce these seams, I'm going to go all the way around once with a zigzag stitch and then I'm going to go all the way around a second time with a straight stitch. And that way I'll know that these seams are going to be nice and strong. And if you're going to do that choice, you're going to want the zigzag stitch to be on the outside and the straight stitch to be on the inside so that when you open it up, the straight stitch is going to be the one that's going to have the most um, durability against tugging open. 
So I'm gonna grab my pins and then we'll sew that together. So all I've done is I've just thrown some pins all the way around my square and you don't need to pin like every inch or anything. I've just pinned in the corners and then I put a pin where you have the seams on the pillow topper and that's going to keep things nice and aligned as well as reminding me to slow down as I approach this pin to make sure that this seam underneath, uh, which is folded in this direction, stays folded in that direction. So you wanna make sure that you don't accidentally sew it uh, like this because you'll get a pucker from that. Now, I'm just going to use the straight edge of my square as a guide and I'm going to give myself um, you know about a half inch quarter inch seam allowance all the way around and I'm going to go around first with the zigzag and then I'm going to go around a second time inside of that zigzag with a straight stitch. And I just pull my pins out as I go along and I stick them into my RTD2, who has become a pin cushion. Uh, he's kind of handy. So, on the zigzag stitch, make sure that the fabric doesn't pucker at any point. When you start, reverse. And then I'm just working my way around. So this time, as a guide, I am just, uh, if you want to have like a quarter inch seam allowance, the, um, the edge of the foot to the center where the needle is, is a quarter inch on most sewing machines. Like I said, just slowing down as I approach that pin and that seam in my fabric topper to make sure that everything feeds through nicely. And because I am noticing that this edge isn't cut very straight, um, the other thing that you can do is I know this edge here is straight and so I'm keeping this edge the same distance away from the foot over here. time to uh, to turn a corner you want to go to where you're calling the seam allowance down here on this end and to reinforce the corner I like to back up and go towards it again then you want to put the needle down into the fabric so make sure the needle is down in the fabric you can now lift your foot and that needle is not going to go anywhere you can rotate the fabric put the foot back down and keep sewing in the new direction So now I've gone all the way around with the zigzag stitch, so I'm ready to go, oh, I ran out of bobbin thread, so I'm going to need to sew this last section again after reloading my bobbin. So I can pull my bobbin out like this, and it's empty to reload your bobbin. Most machines have a bobbin uh, loading place on top and directions are machine specific as to how to wind off of the, um, off of your uh, spool of thread and onto the bobbin. So I will re-thread my bobbin. I will re-sew that last six inches that missed out on being sewn because the bobbin ran out. And then I will show you uh, going around with my straight stitch. So now I'm gonna go ahead and sew my straight stitch uh, all the way around. So I'm leaving my threads attached um, just because it's easier and it's one less uh, loose end that you have to trim off later. 
and I'm just going to use the zigzag stitch that I put in before as the guide to sew a straight stitch all the way down along my fabric. Sometimes my sewing machine jams. This is uh, something that you get because it is a cheaper machine. And uh, when that happens, if you do get a jam, you just need to uh, wiggle back and forth and get your fabric out the best you can. Sometimes that might include uh, snipping some threads on top and underneath. There we go. And usually when you jam, you end up with a bunch of extra thread. Uh, usually the jam thread I find is coming off of the bobbin and not off of something else. So you gotta pull all that extra bits out. Uh, Rethread your needle apparently and uh, re-catch re the bobbin thread. And the fact that it is, uh, my machine has been jamming quite a bit in the last little while and for a couple years it wasn't, it might need to mean that my sewing machine needs a servicing. But for now, it's nothing that I can't work around. So let's get back to where we were with my straight stitch. And when you do have a cut like that, you do want to back up uh, and go forward over that spot just so that you don't have anything coming loose. It's important that when you do get a jam like that, you want to lay off the pedal right away and release the jam by hand because if you're trying to use the motor to drive the needle through the jam section, uh, you can break the needle, which can send a little piece of metal flying towards you. So you don't want that to happen. So as soon as you feel it jamming, lay off the motor and uh, manually um, manually solve the jam problem. And if you're particularly concerned, you can turn the power off while you solve the jam problem. So that's it for sewing. Now I'm just gonna take my scissors and trim all this extra fabric off. And because I did that zigzag, you can actually trim to um, within like a quarter inch of the zigzag. So I'm gonna go ahead and trim this all off and then turn it right side out. So, a serger would obviously do a nicer job of this and essentially by doing a straight stitch and a zigzag stretch, stitch and then trimming, I'm kind of uh, manually mimicking uh, the job that a serger would do all in one. A serger is a sewing machine that's going to uh, sew your straight edge, it's going to trim the fabric down to a, uh, whatever your seam allowance you want and it's going to do like a zigzag to uh, lock in those trimmed edges. So. This was like, you know, it's doing the job of a serger, which costs more money than I can spend right now and would take up space that I don't have in my little apartment and achieves the same effect just by manpower. So just trimming all the way around. So it's all been trimmed, and now I can turn my pillowcase right side out using that uh, opening that we made. And now that it's right side out, and before I put my um, pillow inside, 
You want to stick your fingers into each of the corners and push those corners to a point. If you don't, they're going to want to stay like a belly button and you want to take them from an innie to an outie, if that makes any sense. And because we trimmed back the fabric nice and close, you're going to get a nice point on all four corners of this pillow. And it's lying nice and square and it's ready for the cushion to go in. So we have our finished pillow sham. So we've got the wooden um, sort of quilt looking pieced front and we've got the really nice back with the opening for stuffing. So to stuff it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the short side and I'm going to turn that uh, inside out so that we have like an opening here. Now I'm going to take my cushion and I'm going to grab one corner of my cushion. I'm going to go in through the opening until I get that corner right to the corner in here and then I'm going to pinch that and hold it. I'm going to take the other corner and go in through the opening and I've got both corners inside my cushion. So they're not going anywhere, so now I can start to pull and push the cushion in. And the reason why you want to get those corners lined up nicely is because it's just going to make the cushion be nice and square and not lumpy after. Once you've got it most of the way in, you can flip that other side right side round and put the corners on that side where they need to go. So I know that my green cushion has all four corners in all four corners of my case for my cushion and I can close up my back pocket pouch and then take a look at the final uh, couch cushion. And there we have it! A really great, uh, super easy to make, it only took maybe like, I don't know, 20 minutes of sewing and it looks like something that you would buy, to be honest. So that's one cushion down. That's it for the wooden fabric that I have. So Kevin's gonna have to wait before he gets a matching cushion to go with it. Once again, I'm Sarah. You can follow along with what I'm doing in my life out of a lab coat. And the information for that blog is in the doobly-doo below. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram as at Turner underscore SR. And uh, if there's any weekend project that you would like to see, maybe something you've seen on Pinterest, let me know in the comments below. And I'm always looking for a fun DIY on the weekend. Happy weekend, guys.